And part of what can happen when other people in a household are not as vulnerable as we are, is we can have a sense that we're not known, that we're not understood, and that we don't matter. So in honor of those people, I just want to say to your nervous systems, of course this is alarming. Of course you are alarmed. This is your life that we are holding. Q music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. And we don't want you to worry about taking too many notes, so you can join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club, and we'll send you the transcripts and show notes from every episode. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and I'm going to jump right in and just introduce our guest. Uh, first off, just acknowledge the elephant in the room for me here. It's just a crazy, crazy time, and I think it is for all of us here. The world's kind of, I'm not sure what to say, but we're going to talk to Sarah Payton, one of my favorite guests that we have, and, and how... Uh, how we deal with these crazy times. She's an international speaker and facilitator and has a passion for weaving together neuroscience knowledge and experience of healing to unify our brains and our bodies. And I know I called Sarah because, as they say, immune compromised, whatever that word is, whatever. I'm not sure that's my favorite word, but that's kind of the word people use. I have to tell you that every time someone sneezes within 100 yards of me, I freak out. So, <laughs> or coughs or, 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 you know, I am really doing extreme social distancing. And I'm not, I want to talk to Sarah about how do we unify our brains and our bodies when times like this that, uh, yeah, our fight or flight mechanism, at least mine is on high gear. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks for being on the show. I'm so glad to be here, Sharon. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And especially a pleasure right now when I know that we're reaching folks that are in their homes, can't get out the way they usually can, don't have access to other resources, and you and I get to kind of band together and be a sweet resource for them. Uh, awesome. Yes, because that's, at this time, um, I think we're all sort of missing connection, that connection. Even though we're on Zoom and I love seeing you this way, there is something I, my grandkids sent me a video today, and although it was delightful, it made me sad as well. So, Sarah, what's your thoughts on? I know we'll just. I'm just going to dive in because I don't even know the questions right now. It's just one of those times where, in the thick of it, you don't even know the questions. But what are your thoughts on how people can um, begin to navigate all of these multiple feelings at once? Well. What I was thinking about more than anything else as I was thinking about getting to be with you was the idea that we get to create rings of self-accompaniment around each kind of level of capacity and, and upset and panic and bewilderment that we're carrying. So you and I were talking before we began about the way that both of us have been running for the thermometer. <laughs> we have a tickle in our throat. We're like, oh my God, you know, running to make sure that we can get some sort of input that lets us come back to a little bit of balance. And so we get to actually hold that panicked self with warmth. One of the things that's so important is that we let ourselves make sense to ourselves. We so often want to convince ourselves that we are not doing it right or that we're feeling too much or we're being too sensitive instead of having an enormous affection for the self that goes running for the thermometer and holding her and saying, of course, Sarah, of course. And isn't it reassuring to see that your temperature hasn't actually gone up? I mean, that kind of sweetness with the self, no matter what we're experiencing at every level is a new invitation 
that's radically different from the old invitation to cut ourselves down to size at every turn. Mm, wow. I got chills on some of that because there are times, maybe I'm just clearing my throat, but a little bit of it sounds like a gurgle or a cough. It just, I'm clearing my throat, right? Seasonal allergies, whatever. And there are times that I'm actually having to talk to myself and I find my first response is not a nice thing. Yeah. It's not like, oh, get a grip. Right. Just clearing your throat. Right. Let's talk about a better way to approach that because I find that in this time, of isolation. Yeah, some of the things I say to myself, like, get a grip. But <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't think that's the most helpful. <laughs> if we use my ring analogy, then we're putting a ring about the, around the one that has the, the, the cough in their throat first. And we get to say, of course, of course, Sarah, of course you're worried. But then the one that's saying get a grip, we get to put a nice ring around that one too. And we get to say, Sarah who's saying get a grip you need some acknowledgement that you get alarmed really easily and you like things to be calm. <laughs> <laughs> it's that calm, predictable, or I want a cough just to be a cough again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you like a little acknowledgement of the wear and tear on your soul of autoimmune stuff and how much you long for like predictable, easy health and stability? You know, we get to make those guesses for ourselves, those sweet, caring guesses. You know, that's that's true. Because once you know, I was laughing during that time, but it's so true that whatever, the, the thinking about the old normal of just a couple of months ago, you're thinking, wow, all I had to wonder was, is this seasonal allergies or cold or the flu. Now, I know the flu can be quite deadly, but somehow we've gotten used to it, stabilized it somehow in my mind. That, okay. It doesn't overflow the hospitals. Yeah. It doesn't take out all our respirators. It's a different and deadly for some of us, but it is not this present thing that we're in the relationship with, with the coronavirus. I love that word in relationship with. Let's talk about how you view this term. That really struck a chord with me when you said in a relationship with, I'm like, wow, I want a divorce, but okay. <laughs> a global divorce. Let everybody go back to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why do you say in a relationship with? I mean, I find that, I don't know why my mind went there, but uh, I find that a fascinating point of view. Yeah, well, we've talked before about how we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, and our left hemisphere likes to get things done, and our left hemisphere is not in relationship with anything. Our left hemisphere, it, well, it's sort of in relationship with our to-do list. It likes <laughs> the to-do list to be done. <laughs> but it's not actually changed by anything. And here we are, we're in a profoundly changed space in relationship to what's happening right now. So we're already in a relationship with this virus because it has changed our lives. It has created the shelter at home, it's changing our economy. Uh, um, we've seen, for goodness sake, we've seen our president who very rarely changes anything make quite a few changes in the last month in response to this. So this is, this is something big, this is something profound, and we are all being changed by it. Some of the changes are quite positive. Some of the changes are quite scary. So a positive change would be the decreased air pollution. Thousands and thousands of people receiving a reprieve who would have died from the air condition, the air pollution levels that ha have fallen over the last three months. That's quite positive, quite negative. So many people now in domestic violence situations having the experience of not having less choice, less freedom, less safety as a result of the coronavirus. So it's a complex and huge effect that's going on. And I think that's why I call it a relationship. A very multidimensional relationship. We know the other things, the virus and the death toll and all of that, but you're bringing up these outer rings of, I'm thinking of when you put 
throw the pebble in the water, you know, you get these on the outer rings that will continue to ripple far beyond the passage of this tsunami of the virus coming through. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating to me. I agree with you. I, I was reading about the air pollution and I went, wow. I was joking with a friend the other day. I had to run out and do some, my weekly grocery shopping and said, my goodness, it solved our traffic problem. Yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who drives Instacart in L.A. And she's whipping everywhere. She's boom, boom, boom. She says, I've never seen so little traffic in my life. <laughs> so I guess we can call that a positive, too, looking for the sunny side without. But, okay, that's interesting, Sarah. What just happened to me, the little person on my left shoulder just said, you're being Pollyanna. Mm. Isn't that interesting? I was like, yeah. this this duality is, I think, how the speed and the duality, I think, is what's so uh, discombobulating as you begin to navigate it. Yes, and not wanting to minimize people's uh, people's struggles, I think, is is very. I, I imagine that's hugely important for you, as it is for me. Oh, absolutely. I'm blessed. Knock on wood. I'm hunkered down, and and uh, everything. I've got a home and water and electricity, lots of lots of things other people don't have. So I'm really blessed. And yeah, it is tough to um, hear. And sometimes I've had to isolate myself from the news for a little bit, just because it is so easy to get sucked into your phone's news, the news on the television. Oh my gosh, it's so easy just to get sucked into the vortex of that. And there can be very important contracts that take us into that, you know, contracts for vigilance, contracts, if we come out of now, because trauma impacts the immune system so greatly, there are very many of us who have autoimmune conditions who lived in dangerous childhoods. And so when we've lived in dangerous childhoods, our nervous systems can have contracts with us to know everything that's happening, which can mean that we're on the news 24-7, which is not restful and gives our immune systems and our bodies much less of a chance to recover. So we're, we're, we need to be very gentle and place another, you know, another one of these rings of compassion and self-compassion and self-warmth and self-affection around the part of us that's wanting to look at the news all the time because it's trying to save us. And we can see, you know, we've talked about contracts in the past. And uh, so if this were a contract uh, that I had, um, and I have worked with several people who had these contracts, I will be aware of everything. I will gather every little piece of knowledge so that I can save myself and my family, no matter the cost to myself. And then we get to make that inquiry with ourselves that... Uh, do you want to keep this contract? Now that you know you have it, do you want to keep it? And sometimes we're like, yes, I need it all. Or sometimes we're like, I think if I slept and I woke up again, I would be able to integrate what had happened over the last eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's modify this contract. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We can still stay informed, but maybe it doesn't have to be every minute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so true. Not only me, but I'm thinking a lot of the outlets that like the social media outlets are just swarmed by it, too. And mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm at a loss of, I'll say, all of the other news. Yeah. I, there are times that it's happening in the world. <laughs> There's right. got to be something else yeah. happening. I mean, not to minimize this, but there there, there has to be something else happening that I, I found that, uh, you know, searching uh, DIY websites or something for my home and things are like that just to take my mind off of things. And I find a lot of people are reaching for what I'll say, are, are, I'll say non-screen or non-technology. I have a lot of friends that are doing puzzles via video conferencing. Oh. Like, you know, where do you think this one goes? I, I thought that would be fun to do puzzling. Although, I, I don't know, it might be kind of hard to see, but <laughs> they say they love it. They they say, oh, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I say, oh, can I do the child's puzzle with five pieces? We'll be good. But I find that people are going back. I had a friend... Uh, uh, I, we were texting back and forth, and um, she and her partner are now playing card games, which they used to love, 
<laughs> gave up about a decade ago and now are playing card game, card games again. So I find it just interesting as, and you had the perfect word, this relationship that we're trying to make sense of and yeah. trying to find the positive in as well as understand and come to um, some place. I'm not sure what place, a place of understanding of all the negative parts of it too. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. So I'm, like I said, I'm not really f sure of my questions. I didn't come with a list of questions here. What are some things that you're hearing from people that you would like to share as you say, you know, if people understood this, this would be the helpful for them. Beginning to to see every little thing that we're beating ourselves up for as a, as a very grounded survival response, that our brain is doing the very best that it can to take care of us. So one of the things to know is something we've talked about before, the default mode network. And the way that the default mode network gets upset and worried about things in the middle of in the middle of it all the default mode network is the brain's automatic voice and it starts up beating us it's the part that beats us up it's also our creative voice so it's an important voice but when we've had trauma it's a very sarcastic cutting critical uh, merciless voice and so when we're trapped in our houses and we can't go out and do our usual things that let us uh, release stress, that let us uh, take care of ourselves, that let us distract ourselves, all of a sudden, we talked about people being caught in their homes in domestic violence situations. We can be caught in our brain in an internal domestic violence situation. And when we are in that situation with the inside of our brain, we need to hold ourselves with a great deal of warmth as we do whatever it is that we do to survive this. If you, we are eating for comfort, we go, thank you for eating for comfort. Thank you for, for trying to take care of me with chocolate or ice cream or whatever it is. Um, uh, if we're um, watching Netflix ceaselessly, then we get to know, oh, I'm taking care of my default mode network. I'm keeping my brain from killing me by doing these repetitive uh, experiences that distract me. I'm playing solitaire. I'm playing online video games. I'm playing first-person shooter games. And, and it, it's even hard to get up to the, go to the bathroom. No wonder it's hard to get up to go to the bathroom because that lets the internal critical voice loose. So if we begin to notice this, then we start to create this wonderful, um, almost like in a ship they have on one of the biggest masts, they have a little bridge, a little tiny crow's nest up high on the mast of the ship. And a little bit what we're doing when we begin to see our brains with compassion is we're allowing ourselves to climb up high and look down on the ship of self and say, oh yes, I do have a very critical internal voice. And it does definitely want to kill me, and I don't know what to do about it, and it's very good to be watching Netflix. It creates a different level. Again, this is what I was thinking about, is these levels and rings of self-compassion that we put around every behavior as we're managing our way through this difficult time. You have the best metaphors. I love that idea of looking from your crow's nest down onto the ship yeah. and seeing all the different parts that are going on and maybe how, you know, there's, where is the guy at the rudder? <laughs> where is that guy? That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh. We need to take a quick commercial break while I will look for that guy with, at the rudder and we'll be right back. Oh. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. 
Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and tonight we're talking with Sarah Payton. We've had her on the show before numerous times, and one of our most favorite guests, and she is an international speaker and facilitator, and as you're hearing, she just has this deep, deep knowledge and passion for weaving together the neuroscience knowledge and the experience of, of healing between our brains and our bodies. And gosh, I couldn't have thought of anybody better to help explain Oh, gosh. At first, you know, I I used to describe it as uh, my friends would start saying, oh, my gosh, you know, I hear a sneeze from a mile away and I jump and I was sarcastic. You brought up that sarcastic little person (laughs) and I'd say, welcome to my world, um, because that's been going on since my diagnosis. But now I find, yes, and it's going on at a heightened level for me at the diagnosis. I I had in the past six years since the diagnosis, I, I think I'd sort of stabilized uh, where I was at with the immune system and all of that. I, in my mind, I had stabilized. And now that I have my friends who aren't familiar with that lifestyle, uh, that operating mode, saying that they're in that mode. And um, I'm just curious about what happens as a group, as a herd when the whole herd is in that mode. (laughs) Do you have any knowledge of how we as, not that I'm any expert in it, but sort of when I said, welcome to my world, part of me can reflect and like, Sharon, you've made it six years having this immune system that, you know, needs a lot more delicate care than others. Um, What are your thoughts on what happens when the whole uh, herd uh, kind of becomes hypervigilant. There, it has an effect on us, of course. And, um, and if we're in a situation where we're relying on the news in order to be able to track everything that's going on to make ourselves feel safer, then we're even more in the group energy of it, which is an even greater idea, a greater uh, recommendation, encouragement for us to take, to take those news breaks and to take a, have a little diet from social media so that our nervous systems and our immune systems get to do a little bit of a reset and we get to feel our own selves. It took me about two and a half or three weeks from the time that the coronavirus kind of intensity began until I reached a point where I could actually find my own body again. It was, I was being asked to do little coronavirus self-resonance videos, which you find on my YouTube channel. And I do one every day. 
and the and my team was saying we have to put these out people need these and i was like well i don't even know if i can do them because i don't even know if i found my body again after the shock of this experience so the part of the answer to your question is can we find our own bodies in the middle of a herd shock in the middle of the shock waves of society can we find ourselves again is the first question because we we do go into shock with these big things and then the second part of your question is do we get to have our own body and this is such a good question for anybody who's got immune system effects because our sensitivity and capacity for empathy can lead us as little children to make contracts and agreements with ourselves not to really have our own body it's almost like we're loaning our body out to the universe we're loaning our body out to our families we're loaning our body out to society in the hope that it will manifest our love our very great love for the world and create some sort of balance in a world that we know is out of balance but this is a child's vow of love this is a helpless vow of love from a little child that doesn't know that it's okay to both have our own bodies not loan them to anybody not give them not give our consent to be part of the herd energy but rather to be our own self and still love doesn't change our love but it just means that we don't have to loan our own bodies out how is it to hear this sharon it is really hitting home i mean i'm a little bit speechless right now because i'm taking this in as if everyone sometimes this happens when i talk to sarah it's like it was meant i was meant to hear it, it this is the moment i need to hear this type of thing I find that so powerful, this idea of centering myself. I have been working on, uh, working on is the weird word there, because normally it's quite easy for me to meditate, but lately it's been work. <laughs> I've had to keep calling myself back to center much more often than I would say n my normal would be. But I had never heard this idea of loaning yourself out. Yet I, I myself, I can raise my hand as well as I can think of a number of people in our community. Uh, I won't speak for them, but I'm pretty sure that they would raise their hand too when, when they hear those words. And one of the things that we've talked about before, and I'm wondering if this isn't a time for a lot of us to, to spend the isolation time that we're having to explore and how we would do that. What are some of the first steps that we begin to explore? Have I been loaning my body out? And if the answer comes back, yes. Hmm. What are the first steps that we can yes. begin to call home? So, so one of the first steps is to begin to imagine some kind of installation layer between your body and the rest of the world. Just to see if it feels like you have your own consent to be to be your own self and to see whether to see whether you actually are okay with that would you be okay if you in a way turned off the receivers that are bringing in the vibrations from the rest of the world would it be okay with you to imagine a kind of a radio silence around yourself just for a little moment and even as i say those words radio silence i can feel just a little bit of kind of a protective layer between myself and the world there's something about that metaphor that's helping me to find my own body as its own self because that's part of what we're doing is we're awakening our own imagination of ourselves as a sovereign being like this is my kingdom this body is mine and it's me and it's my kingdom and i am the queen or i am the king of my own kingdom and uh and it doesn't belong to anybody else now we get to see if we have objections because any objections that we have to radio silence or to sovereignty let us know that we may have an old agreement 
So if it feels like it endangers the family or endangers the world to have this insulation layer, um, then we know already that we're, that we're in a little bit of trouble. Um, and that we get to begin to work with the contracts. And we get to say, if I had a contract, I, Sarah, solemnly swear to my essential self that I will use my body to balance my family. Or I will use my, my love to take care of the world. Or sometimes we have a contract that mixes love and worry. That I will worry myself to death in order to let the world know that I love it. Then we want to check and see, do we want that contract? Do we want to keep that agreement? Is that a good idea? And then we, if we say, no, that's not a good idea, then we can actually do a formal release. And we've played with this on the show before. I, Sarah, I release you from this vow. I revoke this contract. I no longer want you to loan your body out to the world to make it a better place. I have an idea that you could love, Sarah, without loaning your body out. Would you like to try it? I give you my blessing to try. How is it to hear, Sharon? Awesome. Awesome. A couple of things that came to my mind as you said that was, um, I want to talk a little bit, go back. I, we I did a show on alarmed aloneness. And I know a lot of people are feeling alone. Oh. Either they live alone or maybe it feels alone even if there's someone else around uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, then I also want to just touch a little bit on this concept of worry because I myself I'm worried about my family members I'm you know I'm worried about lots of things right now and I want to talk about uh, you know healthy worry versus worry that can um, etch away at the edges so um, let's let's jump in with either one that you want to start with um uh, the alarmed aloneness, uh, we've talked about how in our Western world, we talk about fight, flight, and freeze. And when we talk about fight, flight, and freeze, we're trying to talk about the sympathetic activation of the nervous system and the collapse or immobilization of the nervous system. And what we, uh, what we need to touch on is an understanding that our nervous system is not just sympathetically activated when we're in fight and when we're in flight, not just with fear and anger, but also with alarmed aloneness, that there's a state for mammals when we lose our important people that puts our body into an emergency state with increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased cortisol. It's a stress state. Yet our language almost wipes out, we've talked about this before, almost wipes out the idea that loneliness would be an alarm state. So we can restore our sense of the importance of accompaniment and the alarm state of aloneness by saying, fight, flight, alarmed, aloneness, and freeze. And this begins to create a more expansive acknowledgement and accompaniment for sympathetic activation that happens when there's nobody there or as you were just pointing out nobody there that we can count on or who can see us there's this thing that humans need which is to be known humans desperately need to have a sense that they make sense and that somebody else knows them and the more deeply we are known, the more relaxed our bodies are in this world. One of our first interviews we did, and I, I just remember it so crystal clear, is you described your beautiful metaphor of a radar system asking, am I safe? And the second question was, do I matter? Yeah. Uh, that, what you just said, just brought me right back to this idea, do, do I matter? Or, you know, do they matter? However you want to frame that. But do I matter? Yeah. And that just brought that home to me when we were talking about aloneness, as well as this understanding of existence. And am I safe? And it, it you know, it's a big question right now. Everybody's asking that. I'm, am I safe even in my home? Because 
that package just arrived and I have to sanitize the package for heaven's sakes. Yes. Total, total game changer in my mind. Never done that before. Right. And, and people are taking their clothes and changing their clothes when they come into the house and washing their clothes right away. And I have a friend who is also immune compromised who says, I figured out that I, I do have, he said, I do have more than one face mask. And I can number my face masks, one, two, three, four. And then I can wear number one. And while well, number two, three, and four are, uh, are the, well, the, the vi any viruses are, are, are disappearing off of those. And then switch the next day to number two, the next day to number three. And then I will have this order that's so supportive. Isn't the, aren't the structures that we begin to put in place. I think this is part of the movement from shock to capacity, is the putting in place of specific routines and structures that support well-being. So that the packages come in, they go to a place where they rest or where they're sanitized. It, it, but, it, but there's this whole process of putting each safety mechanism in place that allows our nervous system to relax again. Is there anything like that for you with the instituting of new routines? Oh, absolutely. I th all of the above, the sanitizing things go in the garage <laughs> first, and they sit there for several days, or if I don't need it right away. Otherwise, I wipe it down. Uh, the masks, uh, for sure. One of the things I've done, and I, I'm not in my vehicle a lot, but everything from you know, having to get out to get gas or go to a medical appointment, whatever, go grocery shopping. One day I had got something on my hand. I normally wear gloves if I'm actually, but I had just was just outside my car, didn't put them on, got something on my hand. And I'm looking around at all these different fast food places for a restroom. There are a few that I always know have pretty clean restrooms, right? All of them didn't let me in. Uh -huh. They were like, you can go through the drive through kind of thing, but, but I need to wash my hand. And I couldn't, so now I have a little bucket in my car that has little tiny bottles of those little miniature bottles of water. Uh -huh. I have my favorite soap and a thing of paper towels, my gloves and my numbered masks, because I number my masks as well. And, you know, I never had a little bucket <laughs> in my car before, but there it sits right on the passenger floor. With each emergency, you get to... We, we, we end up having to create a new little routine or structure that can hold our, our immune system with gentleness and, and, and strong protection. Mm, yeah, I would love uh, our listeners to uh, chime in on the comment section of, the, of some of the things that they're doing, because I find it interesting. What are people able to coming up with, you know? Right. I wouldn't have, I didn't think about the bottle of water, soap and paper towels bucket until I needed it. Yes. So I would love to know where other people had to, because to me, there's some comfort when I read other people's great ideas. Mm -hmm. I shared a video on social media the other day that now I understand that these homemade masks are not anything like an N95 or a surgeon's mask. I understand that, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And this was a wonderful little ready, quick way to make a mask out of a scarf and two hair ties. And I'm like, oh, that is just so cool. If I needed a mask right away, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm always wearing a scarf. <laughs> so I'll just start carrying two hair ties in my bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always on the lookout for these ingenious types of things. And you're right, the structure of having the bucket there did ratchet down the safety uh, the the hyper the hyper vigilance the alarm when you know you have good structures in place then there's a greater relaxation it's like we can have the structures help hold us in these times of difficulty i want to acknowledge that some of us live in households where we're trying to create structures and the people in the household are not the same level don't have the same level of vulnerability that we have and end up living differently or making choices that put us at risk. And then there's an entire, like, not only are we holding the safety that we're, the need for safety that's so important to us, but also, again, as we were talking about the amygdala, do I matter? 
And part of what can happen when other people in a household are not as vulnerable as we are is we can have a sense that we're not known, that we're not understood, and that we don't matter. So in honor of those people, I just want to say to your nervous systems, of course this is alarming. Of course you are alarmed. This is your life that we're holding. And of course you are alarmed because sometimes people give themselves a terrible back a, 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 like a backlash against their own alarm, like I shouldn't be so sensitive. But I want us all who are listening to be able to kind of put arms around ourselves and say, of course it's scary. Of course you're alarmed. Of course you need to know you matter. Because this helps us to be calm and focused in our efforts to bring change to the households that we're living in. Mm, I love that. And I want to point out, uh, when you said put our arms around ourselves, in this case, it was a bit metaphorical, but in a, another interview Sarah did with us, we actually did put our arms around ourselves physically, actually did give ourselves a hug. And I was amazed at how fast my my system shifted. Mm -hmm. And even though it's one of those odd things, you know, it's you <laughs> hugging yourself. Yet, in this time of isolation, uh, I, I want to throw out that idea that you shared with us in one of our early interviews is give yourself a hug. Yeah, absolutely. Give yourself a hug. And then many of us know this wonderful word, swaddling, that we use when we're talking about babies. And, and a part of what happens when, when our nervous system is on alert all the time is that we can start to have this sense of kind of an unheld infant self that's screaming in our own hearts and in our own chests and in our own lungs. And this unheld infant self, uh, we can imagine swaddling. It's almost like we can bring like a blanket of light, a snug, warm blanket of light to um, and imagine wrapping our terrified hearts in this sweet, comforting, snug embrace of love and reassurance and comfort and presence that will just that, that brings a little compression to this kind of crazily terrified heart that we may carry within ourselves. And this also can be a sweet kind of meditation, something we can do at three o'clock in the morning when we wake up and go, oh my God, I forgot to sterilize that package. Or, oh dear, I have a headache. I must have a fever. We get to swaddle our terrified hearts. We get to take our temperatures too and swaddle our terrified <laughs> and anxious inner selves. Would, would actual physical swaddling, if you kind of rolled yourself up in your favorite blanket? It can be very sweet. I have weighted blankets that I use that's almost like that, where it's a, it's got little little weights, little plastic weights inside the blanket. That there's a, my husband has a 12-pound blanket. I have a 10-pound blanket. And wow. Yeah. I've, I've read about those. I actually like sleeping with a couple of comforters and some people, times people say, you know, I, like, I go, I like the weight. Mm -hmm. I don't have a weighted blanket, but you know, I do like the weight on me. Yeah. And that my thought came up though, is I do have a favorite blanket oh. and I sometimes fall asleep on, it's really more of a throw type of blanket, but I'm going tonight, I'm just going to like really wrap myself under that and see what happens. Oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. We're down to the last 10 minutes. Time flies with you, but I just want to make sure that you have the opportunity to share any other thoughts that uh, we have. I haven't had the ability to ask and, um, or the wherewithal to ask, I should say. So w what are some other things that you're seeing from your community? Well, uh, one of the things that I love is to let ourselves remember that when we get into sympathetic activation, when we're in our alarm states, we're automatically shifted into our left hemisphere, which is not our love and tenderness hemisphere. It's our get things done hemisphere. So the more that we uh, let ourselves realize, again, this is another place where we're creating that ring of self-holding, that we're holding, like we're creating affection for our to-do person. <laughs> <laughs> 
I like that idea, creating affection for our to-do person. It's like our anxious and and productive little efficient self that's doing all this, you know, that's creating the routines and has the bucket and is making sure that everything gets sterilized. And we get to have so much affection for her or him or them. We get to just surround their, their, their little beings with affection, which is a very funny and sweet uh thing to contemplate you can if it's hard to imagine doing it for yourself you can think of somebody you know who's very busy and very much oriented towards getting things done and just imagine sitting back in a comfortable chair watching them with great warmth and affection like you're putting a little cloud of affection around your little your get things done person and then you can kind of switch it to being yourself sometimes it's easier to practice on someone outside of ourselves and then to substitute sneakily substitute our own self in there as the person that we're having affection for one thing i found instead of actually substituting another person is just calling by my name i mean oh, a third per okay. using third person <laughs> That's, there's wonderful research that shows how effective that is. Yes, and and I know well in a lot of your contracts, everything you're you're always using your name, or when you're coaching us to do it, you're saying you know insert Sharon here or whatever whosoever's name it is, insert your own name there, because I think that's so profound that we call ourselves by our own name. Uh, oftentimes, I find we we call ourselves by all sorts of less than affectionate labels, and sometimes talking about when I first learned this idea of talk about yourself in third person and what would you do if it was someone else and then make you talking about yourself in the third person is really powerful. It's way to powerful. change. And it creates a differentiation in the brain between the part of the self that's having the emotional experience and the part of the self that's holding that emotional experience with care. Mm, wow. Letting ourselves notice that there are two parts of ourselves. There is a prefrontal cortex that is able to say, oh, of course, Sarah. And there's a part of ourselves that's going, ah, ah. And another part that says, oh, of course. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. Now, um, we just have six minutes left, but I want to say, uh, we've been talking about ourselves and working with ourselves. What ha Do you have any thoughts on dealing with family members, I'll say the elderly or our children that are inundated as well that we can help soothe? See what happens if you say, if you just see what it's like to give up fixing and to say, of course, of course you're worried. And then to ask, would you like me to say, I believe in you? Would you like me to say, I, do you like it when I say I love you? Just check. It's so interesting to begin these dialogues with the people that are close to us to say, Dad, do you like it when I say I love you? And he might look surprised and he might say, no, I know that. Or he might say, of course I like it. <laughs> People always think you know, you know, when you begin these dialogues. Or with a teenage child, a teenage son or daughter or multi-gender person, you say, do you like it when I say I love you? And they say, they say, well, of course, you know, and you never knew that they liked it. So if we start to begin these kind of meta conversations about what it's like to be together and what do people like and what do they find supportive, it's quite, it opens quite interesting doors. Mm, wonderful. Now, share with us your work where we can find these wonderful coronavirus on your youtube site yeah. as well as your book we haven't had a chance to talk about your resonant self and you're writing another book now too i'm so excited for that coming out soon so share with us a little about what's happening in your world besides what we just chatted about oh but thank you well i'm just moving massively to online because i'm not getting to travel and I love to travel and work with people. So there's so much happening online now, which can be found at your self.com and at your empathy brain.com. Your resonant self is the book website and you can see a book video there and there's meditations there for free. And then empathy brain.com. All the online offerings are there. I am uh, the, the book that I wrote is called your resonant self published by Norton and Norton has asked for a follow-up workbook, which will be all about the contracts 
and I'm turning draft one of that in on June 1st to Norton. Woohoo! So. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us about the YouTube channel. Oh, I love yeah. your little videos. Yes. And yes. that's what started this all, everyone. Uh, she posts them to Facebook as well. And I started watching these little daily videos. And it was, for me, it was grounding, I think is the word I want to say. It kept bringing me back into myself. And I, gosh, every, every eve I watched them in the evening because that's what I needed. Yes, yes. Uh, on YouTube, if you put in Sarah Payton, uh, with the, my name, the way it's spelled, S-A-R-A-H-P-E-Y-T-O-N. There's a YouTube channel with lots of little coronavirus videos, just three minutes a piece, just little aspects of things like being lonely or being driven nuts by your pets or not being able to go to the library or um, being afraid of getting sick or being afraid of getting somebody else sick. All these tiny little aspects of what it's like for us as humans right now on YouTube, on the Sarah Payton channel. And as you could tell, we just got uh, about 50 minutes with Sarah. Can you imagine every night getting three minutes of this wisdom, everyone? So it's Sarah Payton. Uh, it's S A R A H. P-E-Y-T-O-N, Sarah Payton, and check them out on YouTube and share them all across your social media because they are powerful. And I know that they'll change the world. A lot of us, especially in the immune uh, world here, really use use the resource because it's awesome. Sarah, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us every, every day on your YouTube channel because I was just drawn to those and I wanted to bring you back on. And so everyone, that's Sarah Payton. Her website is empathybrain.com. Her book is Your Resident Self, and you can find that at all the usual book outlets as well as her website for the book, yourresonantself.com. And have a great week, everyone. Do You know, I know you do your best every day. That's uh, Give yourself grace is what I keep telling myself, that uh, I'm giving myself grace for this whole whole thing here. And love you, you all. Sharon. Yeah, thank you, Sharon, for having this show for people and just love to you and love to all the folks. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I love you so much. Thank you for being in my world. And everyone, thank you guys for being in my world. Share in the comment section. Let us know some of your thoughts, things that you're doing that you found helpful. Maybe Sarah sparked some ideas with you that you're going to implement. Share with us because that's how we all learn. And everyone, have a great week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired Conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, 
We say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y. C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. See you there.